I'm Sherry McGregor Cook. Now, we are seeing miracles. It's not that we're not seeing miracles. But when we read about the tremendous, astounding miracles you've seen, we're just so hungry for more of God. Because we want, we're want we seeing the lost get saved. I can hide from Thanksgiving. And Sherry Hall's led one of my neighbors to the Lord that I've been praying for. Isn't that awesome? And somebody's been saved all the time. And we just want you to share from your heart. They didn't bring their movie from Panama. But, you know, it may be God. Because we just want to hear, what are you doing right? What can we do better? We are so, how many things you say? You just want to learn. We are so hungry. Do you want to greet the people, Jimmy? Do you usually greet the people we like that? She usually does half of the night and the other half. Whatever you're doing, we'll have She does the best half. Praise God. Well, you know, the last half is always the best half. Amen? We get born again, but but it's it's us going to the Father and taking all kinds of people with us. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. Uh, do I need to be up here? Can I stand down? Or whatever. Hallelujah. Well, we thank God that we have an opportunity to come back here. This is a great place. And as I'm talking with your pastor, it seems to be even greater than we remembered it. But that's the way it's supposed to be. Amen? Praise yeah. God. Well, uh, you know, I, I believe, just like your pastor, that we need to have the Word of God go forth. And then those things which we share, we can judge. You know, we can be like those people in Berea, Berea, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, they heard Paul preaching, but then they went home and they searched the Scriptures to see if it's so. Amen? Amen. So I, I just want to share with you what you're doing in Panama, what the body of Christ is doing in the world. And some of the times people have asked us, why is it that it seems that God is manifesting more over there than over here. And tonight I hope to be able to answer a little bit of that. God is no respecter of persons. He'll do whatever He does over there, over here. Now, for example, in the, in the jungle, uh, it's a little easier to use your faith because the options are suffer or die. Right. There are no alternatives that you can turn to. Now that makes it a little more difficult for you. Because you have all kinds of alternatives. And that's where you have to make the decision. You know, is God true? Did He say whatever He said, is it the truth? Or was He just, you know, trying to fill pages? Well, praise God. He's called you the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And you know that when darkness comes... Your light gets bright. I don't know if you've ever used a flashlight in the day, but you know, it's not very bright. But boy, at night, it can really help you. Amen? And, and, and light is good because it'll help you miss those holes and tree trunks, or depends on where you live, you know. Uh, it'll help you miss them. But another thing that comes with light is insects. And so if you're not willing to put up with the insects, then turn your light. Now I say that because we are the light. And those things which the light draws, many times are the things that's trying to discourage us from continuing. I remember uh, uh, many years ago, I was with my older brother in Indiana. I'm a Hoosier, but don't hold it against us, amen. I'm a Christian now. I was a Hoosier. And uh, we were out in, in the back of his yard in the autumn, in the evening, and we're talking, and here comes a, a mosquito. You know, and lands on his, on his arm. And he said, in the name of Jesus, mosquito, don't you dare bite. Well, you know, there's a lot of things that are rebellious in this world, and that mosquito's one of them. You know, he just, mm, just went for the blood. And my brother said, well, you know what the wages of sin is, don't you? <laughs> you see, we need to be willing to put up and then take care of whatever is trying to discourage us from doing what we need to do. And that is we need to shine. We need to be the light. We need to be the one to lead. Amen? Amen. Um, so anyway, I'm just going to refer to the to these scriptures, you can go home and read them. I, I really hope that you will. I believe that you will. Uh, this church, I tell you, as soon as we walked in, there, there's 
there's something about this church uh, that, that I know that you don't just let the word go in one ear and out the other. Amen? Amen. Uh, so, uh, in, in 2 Samuel, now I'm, I'm not a real strong Old Testament man. Because you see in the Old Testament that it was written in types and, and examples. But in the New Testament, Jesus came to give us the truth. But then with that truth, we can go back and look at the Old Testament. Amen? But in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we see in there where um, there's news that come from the uh, death of King Saul and his son Jonathan. And this news comes to a nurse who's taking care of the son of Jonathan. His name is Mephibosheth. And in, during that time, if one king over, overcomes another king, generally speaking, he would seek out the family of the king that lost and he'd kill him. So that he didn't have to worry about a resurrection or a resurrection or insurrection, I should say, in, in a few years. And, and so uh, the nurse, when she hears that uh, Saul has been killed and Jonathan, she is protecting or taking care of the son of Jonathan. She takes him and apparently quite rapidly goes to a different place called Lodabar. And in the process, this little boy, he uh, falls. It must have been terrible because it says he, he was laying on both feet. And so he goes to Lodabar in the house of Machir. Now Lodabar in Hebrew, it means without pasture. In other words, you're going to die. If you can't eat, you're going to die. And, uh, and, and the house of Machir, a uh, Machir in the Hebrew signifies a salesman. And you know, a salesman is the type of person that if he can get a good price for anything, he'll sell. There's no attachment there. So you can imagine that here he is uh, in this type of environment and people saying to him, you know, you should be king. That, that, that King David is terrible. He shouldn't be. You were in the lineage, you, you know, and, and tell him all this kind of stuff. Just like the world tells the, the people who are not Christian about our father. You know, well, it was his fault you were lame. It's, it's his fault that you don't have all these things. You, you don't want to, uh, you know, join the church because, you know, all they're going to do is they're going to tell you you can't do this and you must do that. And, and they're even going to rob your money. But now if we go to chapter 9, we see David who is a man after God's own heart. Amen? Amen. And uh, he's saying, you know, I had a covenant with Jonathan. Now we know Jonathan was dead, but that covenant continued. And he said, does anybody know anyone that uh, possibly could be uh, of the family, you know, uh, still alive? And this one individual named Ziba, he said, oh yeah, I said, I think there's a, there's a Jonathan's son um, out in a place called Lodabar. And so David said, well, go get him. Now, can you imagine, here Mephibosheth is crippled, so he can't run. He sees the king's men, he figures, uh-oh. They finally come, they realized I'm alive and they're going to kill me. And so, you know, he's, he's probably uh, uh, not all excited about going and seeing King David. But they take him there and King David uh, uh, welcomes him and he said, uh, uh, who, who am I that you would, you know, treat a person like me in this way? You know, I, I'm nothing but a dead dog. Well, you know, in, in the Middle East, being a dog is bad. Being a dead dog is worse. So you can see he's got this, he's formed this because he's been in Lodabar in the house of nature around people who didn't know David. Amen? But David said, look, I want to restore to you everything that you've lost. You see, that's our message. That's what we do. We go out, every one of us knows somebody that's out there that has the wrong understanding of who our father is. They're out there blaming him. And they're suffering. And we need to be those Zebas that goes out there and says, Hey, you know what? Uh, come, come. Because our Father wants you to sit at his, his table and sup with Him. He wants to restore to you everything that the devil has taken from you. Or religion or whatever you want to call it. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, we, we in Panama, with your help, are going out and telling people about our great God. And telling about who they are once they get saved. Once they get filled with the Holy Ghost. See, we're very strong. We're extremely strong on authority. Because, you see, we have authority. Yes. If we don't use it, that's our fault. But we have authority. Amen. I remember uh, uh, this one particular individual, Rogelio. 
Now, the, the Indians that we minister to, they're, they're short. But Rogelio, he's shorter than short. Uh, but boy, once he understands, once he grabs a revelation, I mean, that man's a powerhouse. Now, let me, let me tell you this. Um, faith comes through revelation. Now, the Bible says it comes by hearing and hearing the Word. And revelation comes by hearing and hearing. In other words, it's the Holy Ghost that reveals to you. Because you can read the Bible all day long. And, and if your heart is not right before God, and open up what the Holy Ghost is saying, you're not going to get the revelation. You're not going to have strong faith. Amen? Amen. So, uh, here at this, this village, they went out and they, they uh, planted corn. Now, they don't use mechanized type machinery down there. They, the only mechanism is their arm. They get a machete to go out and they cut down the jungle. And then they get this uh, stick and they poke a hole in the ground. And then they put, used to, not anymore, hallelujah, but used to put three seeds in each hole. One for God, one for the devil, and one for themselves. See, they thought the devil was uh, equal with God. Well, he's not. He's under our feet. And uh, so they went out and they had planted this. And then they waited for a certain time to go out to, you know, see whether or not the seed uh, started to grow. And they found that a bunch of rats had come in and ate up all their seed. This is of the whole village, every person who had, had planted. And so they replanted. And then one time that the, uh, you know, the plant should have come up, they went out and the rats apparently thought, boy, this must be the year of Jubilee. We're getting fed twice because they ate all the seed again. And uh, so I'm ministering in this particular village and I'm talking to them about who we are in Christ. And Rahelio grabbed a hold of them. And uh, at the end of the service, he told everybody there in the village, he said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to plant again. And they said, well, you know, you're kind of crazy. I don't know why you'd want to go out and feed the rats again. He said, I'm not going to feed the rats. So he went out. He walked all around his land. He told the rats and every other kind of pestilence. He said, you will not touch my seed. Well, three and a half months later, he's the only person that had corn. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I, I want to share with you. You might have heard it. Um, it it's, a, it's a great story, but it helps you understand who you are in Christ. See, we've been blessed to have had nine people raised from the dead in our ministry. And, uh, you know, it wasn't because of us. In, in our abilities, it was the fact that we just happened to be there when God needed us to be there. But that's what we need to do in the body of Christ. We need to go out and be there when God needs to manifest Himself. And see, if we're all the time sitting back worrying about those little mosquitoes, we'll never be able to do it. Amen? Amen. But uh, uh, we were going out into this one particular village. Well, I'm going to let Jeannie share that one. I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you about this other one. <clears throat> We had this particular individual that uh, uh, he, he loved God and he was uh, doing what many of the Indians do. He was climbing this coconut tree. And uh, when he got up there, he lost his footing, lost his, he, he lost his, uh, his hold on the tree and fell about 40 feet and uh, fell on his back and just missed a huge rock with his head. And uh, uh, the people got around there and thought, you know, he was dead. And generally, a fall like that on, you know, falling on your back, you probably would be. But they realized he was uh, breathing, so they took him to the only clinic, which was 15 miles away. And when they got there, they said, well, we don't have any x-ray machines or anything, anything like that, so we're going to have to send you into Chapo, which is near Panama City. And uh, no one else could go because there wasn't enough room in the ambulance. And they took him there, and uh, we were able to, to pray with him. And when he got in there, the doctor said... Uh, after he took x-rays and everything like that, he said, uh, you're going to be a quadriplegic for the rest of your life. Your, your back is literally severed. And uh, uh, he said, no, no. He said, uh, by the stripes of uh, Jesus, I'm healed. And the doctor said, you're crazy. In fact, he said, just to prove it to you, I'm going to donate your first wheelchair. So they took him into this, uh, this hospital area where there were 12 other people. Now, you, you don't want socialized medicine. Believe me, you don't. Um, and, and so uh, uh, they laid him on the bed, and they laid him facing the wall, which is a blessing. Because right, the, the doctor rolls up the wheelchair and puts it right there by his bed. See, he can't see that wheelchair. And the only thing out of his mouth is, I thank you, Father, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Thank you, Father, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. 
Well, some of the other people in there, one guy had had an accident, and from his knee down, his leg was completely uh, shattered, and so they were going to have to amputate that. There was another Indian in there who had fallen out of a tree, and literally his legs were back up like this and over his shoulders. And uh, a lot of other people in there that were, were severely hurt. And uh, they, they kept hearing him say this. And the man with the uh, crushed leg, he'd say, uh, uh, Tiliano, would you just shut up? Maybe you did hit your head. You're crazy. You can't even get up and go to the bathroom and you're talking about being healed. But that wouldn't, that wouldn't uh, change it. See, all he, thought, all he could see was the wall. And he kept saying, thank you, Father, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. So four days later, he feels this warm feeling come all over. And next thing you know, he jumps out of bed and he's doing a little bit of a jig, you know. And he's going, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. And all the other people, it's about 11.30 at night. You know, all the lights are out and everything. There are people going, what are you doing, Tiliano? Shut up, go to bed, go to sleep. No, I'm healed. No, shut up, shut up. You always say you're healed. Well, so he just kind of danced over to where the guy had the crushed leg. And uh, he, he kind of looked up, you know, it's, it's dark in there. And, and all of a sudden he sees Tiliano. He says, Tiliano, what are you doing over here? You're, you're, you're supposed to be in bed. He said, I told you I'm healed. Hallelujah. He said, Wow, do you, you think God healed me? He said, sure he would. Laid hands on him. Next thing you know, I had two people out dancing a jig. <laughs> thanking Jesus. Yeah. And so this other Indian who had fallen out of the tree, he, he said, Tidiano, Tidiano, I, I don't know your God. He said, do you think that, that your God would, would heal me? So Tidiano and the other guy, you know, they just kind of danced over there. You know, they're all, all excited about it. And it's still dark. And Tidiano said, sure, laid hands on him. The next thing you know, there's just noise as his, his legs and everything and back is coming up, uh, clear back into position. And so now he's out dancing. And here comes the nurse. She's flipping the knife. What in the world's happening in here? You guys make some, don't you know this hospital? You're supposed to be asleep. What are you doing? Well, we just turned the light on, you know, and asked what they're doing. They said, we're getting ready to go home. She said, you can't do it. They said, watch us. <laughs> and they all packed up and went home except Tidiano because he lived in the jungle he couldn't get home so the next day the nurse said that night so I'm going to tell the doctor so the next day the doctor comes in and here's Tidiano sitting on the edge of the bed never been able to set up and the doctor comes over there and says Tidiano said I'm going to take you in I'm going to run x-rays and then I'm going to operate on you Tidiano said well you can run the x-rays if you want to but you're not going to operate on you hallelujah you see, that's what you are equipping people in the Darien jungle to do. And that is to grab the Word and to stay with the Word, thank God for it, and then see the manifestations come. Amen? Amen. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to just share... Well, no, praise God. I'm, I'm going to let my wife share the good... She always gets an opportunity to share the good Word. But... Listen, this is the one thing I want to encourage you as, as Jenny gets ready to come up. You are the hope of the world. You are the light of the world. People all around you are watching you. They're hoping that what you say is true. You have to show it to them that it is. You have to prove to them that your father is who he says he is. And, and you know, no, don't back off. Don't back off. You know, faith is believing that your dad told you the truth. Amen? And, and, and you just need to, to realize that everything else out there, like those mosquitoes, is trying to get you off of the truth. But the world needs you. Amen? So I just want to encourage you. We, we've seen all kinds of things happen down there. And it's, there again, it's not because... We're from Indiana. It's because we're from heaven. It's because we have Jesus in us. It's because the Word of God, the truth of God, comes out of our mouth and it, it affects things. And that's the same way with you. That God is, is no respecter of person. Say, man, Jeannie, you want to come up and, and share some really, really good, great things? Hallelujah. share a little bit of the history uh, of our ministry. 
uh, due to the Darien Jebel in eight, uh, 1891. <laughs> <laughs> Not that old. 1980. Uh, we went to Panama as missionaries in 1981. We worked in a leper colony there. Then we moved down into the jungle in 1983. And uh, when we moved to the jungle, uh, we lived, we had four children, ages 8 through 12, and uh, I homeschooled them all. And we lived with the Choco Indians. It was extremely primitive at that time. Uh, children up to 12 years old, nobody wore clothing. They'd never seen a pair of shoes in their life, didn't even know what it was. Uh, the women wore tribal skirts but no tops. The men wore loincloths. And uh, I'm the kind of person that I, I just have to, to feel safe, I have to be in control. I have to know all the facts before I feel safe. And I was so out of my element because when we moved and lived with the Indians, I knew nothing. And I was raised on a farm, but nothing like that. You know, no electricity, no running water, no house, no nothing. You were just out in nature. And the Indians uh, were very superstitious, and they always thought, they'd never seen white people before. And they always thought that white people were born under the moon god, and there was a curse on them. And so here comes this family of six, all the white people, all of us had blue eyes. That was even worse, you know. <laughs> and, but supernaturally, you know, there's something about the timing of God. When we walked in that village and told them what we wanted to do, there was another issue. We did not know the Indian dialect, but supernaturally we understood everything they said. We walked in that village and we presented uh, the the need that we had to, we told the chief we would like to learn how to survive in the jungle. And so he took our family in and we lived with them for 18 months. They taught me how to wash my hair in the river, how to wash clothing in the river while on a rock, how to um, do everything. They taught our children, we have three boys and one girl, and uh, they taught them how to hunt with the bow and arrow, how to fish with the spear, everything. And so after 18 months, they told us they thought we were okay to move into the jungle. Well, while we were in the Indian village, there was a supernatural bond go on there. And it was, we became their family. And when we became their family, it was a bond that, Indians are very relationship oriented, and so we were thicker than blood with them. They would do anything for us. And so we moved on the land, and we, uh, Dennis, <laughs> found this tent in the garbage, and he was sure it was God. So he brought it home, and this tent, I think it was what, 12 by 14 tent? Four kids in a tent. For two and a half years, I mean, come on. Anyway, and it had so many holes in the in the ceiling of it, you didn't even need windows. Because you could see all the stars at night, just looking at it. And, but it rains 150 inches of rain uh, a year, or in nine months. And so before long, we had to, to we started a little bit at a time uh, building our mission house. But it took us 12 years because we had no money, you know. I think we made $350 a month. And so little by little we started building our house. And then uh, we moved into the house when we had three cement blocks up all the way around. A cement floor and a tin roof. And uh, when we moved in that house, uh, it was like all hell broke loose, you know. Because I'm such a detailed person, it was really kind of like I had the stupid for a year and a half. I had no idea that the whole world came alive at night. I, I never even thought about it. I knew there were nocturnal animals, but it just kind of didn't click upstairs until we moved in that house. 
Well, every night, my the floor was covered with snakes. Well, I was deathly afraid of snakes. When we went to Rama, I stepped on a gardener snake, a snake out in our garage and went into shock for two weeks. I had to be put on medicine on a gardener snake. And here in the jungle, there's 48 deadly kinds of poison snakes. And so, but I was determined that nothing was going to take the call off our life. At night, all you could hear was the drums of witchcraft all throughout the jungle. And, but there was something incredibly cool about that. I was never afraid, absolutely never afraid of witch doctors. Never even dawned on me that they could hurt me. And we're talking major witchcraft. They appear and disappear. I seen one, one time uh, a man come walking over the, the river. He shook out a towel. He cursed the village, got back on the towel, and rode away in the supernatural realm. I saw a man turn into a crow one time and fly away. I mean, it's major witchcraft, but never one time did I ever fear them. And I think it's because I was on a mission. I had a call. The call was to destroy the works of the devil. That is the whole message of the gospel, yeah. to destroy the works of the devil. God's children are broken, and we're sent to destroy the works of the devil, to heal the brokenhearted to heal people that have given up on life. And so little by little, you know, a lot of people say, what do you guys, why do you think you've seen so many signs and wonders? It's, it's two words. Dennis is a big man of integrity. And everybody in the jungle knows that they can trust him with their life. And because of that, they give us the right to speak in their life. If you are a man or a woman of integrity, it gives you the right to speak into their life. And number two, obedience. Do what God tells you to do. You know, so many people say, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. But it boils down to one step at a time. Doing what he's telling you to do right now. He told Dennis to volunteer to be the ambulance driver. And so we were the ambulance drivers for seven years. Why would God do that? The light in the darkness. People dying. People at 10 hours away had to go into Panama City. We had 10 hours to pump them full of the Word of God, to pray for them, and make sure that they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was a God that loved them and that would heal them and set them free. Little by little, we started gaining favor with the police in the Darien jungle. Almost everybody in the Darien jungle has ridden in our, the back of our jeep into Panama looking for help. That builds a bond between you and people. Friendship, relationship is what it's all about. And so, as our ministry started growing, Dennis pioneered nine churches. Uh, we started a Bible school. It was a mobile Bible school. He would walk. It didn't matter. One of the Bible schools was eight miles one way. He would walk that and come back twice a week. That is paying the price for the gospel. Right. But there's absolutely nothing more rewarding than to be where God tells you to be and to do what God tells you to do. As we started doing that, there was three missionaries that were killed in the Darien jungle. And when those missionaries were killed, the Panama took all of their missionaries out of the jungle. And that left Dennis and I. And here we were, the targets then, of everything. We live 40 miles from the Colombian border. We live in the heart of the drug world. And so we became the target not only in the drug world, but to Nordiega. Nordiega was a dictator at that time, and he put a contract out on our life. But so many times the police would flood our house at night, and they would come in, and we had no electricity for 12 years, and 
they would come in and, and slam down on the table and say, passports. Here we are all in bed, you know. Get up, put our passports down. And they, on the way out, they'd say, we're so sorry. We're only following orders. You know, we would never do this. Relationship. It's all about relationship. Having friends. Being a true friend. A friend that people can trust. And so, as time progressed, all these young pastors started coming to Dennis for counseling. He was the senior pastor over all of the churches in the Darien. What did he do? He loved them. He counseled them. He encouraged them. He gave them books. Nobody had, had gone to Bible school. And so most of them didn't even read. And what they did read was very, very primitive because there was no schools yet in the jungle. And so because of that, uh, little by little, Dennis got to know them well, and their greatest desire was to go to Bible school. And so when uh, the Lord told Dennis to raise a radio tower in the densest jungle in the world, can you imagine? I mean, we had to have studies on how this would affect the butterflies, how the monkeys would react to this. You know, it was just absolutely nuts. The darkness trying to come against the light. Yeah. As soon as we rose that tower, you know what? A church with 40 people rose that tower. 40 people in one church in the United States $148,000 they raised in one year, and they raised that power. The power of the word of the body of Christ working together. Yeah. A sent one, but everybody working together, doing their part. And that tower was raised. The very first thing Dennis put on that radio was a two-year Raymond Bible College. Wow. It trained all of the pastors in the Darien. And so all the pastors in the Darien are concrete in the Word of God. They believe God with all of their hearts. Uh, we worked with the clinic to start a vaccination program with uh, the children because the disease, the disease in the jungle is like the buffer zone to Panama City. And we had a, a high uh, rate of children dying. And so I, I told the Lord, I said, what can we do? And he told me, vaccination program. And so we started a vaccination program, but the Indians wouldn't let anybody in the villages but us. And so we had to go with them. Us and our four little kids tramping in the jungle to every village. And we get in there and <clears throat> we did all kinds of medical things with them. And that cut the rate of children dying I think it was at 65% at that time, down to 2% today. And then, uh, when they, uh, we now have schools in the jungle, we worked with them to uh, petition the government for schools, and we even have a university now. And I asked the Lord, I said, what can we do in order to make it, uh, make it a, the kids able to go to school because it costs, in Panama, everybody has to wear a uniform. You can't go to school without a uniform. And so it costs $200 a year to, go, to buy those uniforms. And so <clears throat> he told me to bring in a guy from the Peace Corps and teach them a trade. And so I brought in a guy and he taught them the trade that you see out there. With that, all the children pay their own way to school. And you'll ask them, what do you get out of making these? And you know what they'll tell you? Respect. I paid my own way to school. Isn't that just too cool? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they paid their own way. And so I encourage you to buy their stuff because they'll be paying their school bills with that. And so, little by little, the 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 works of darkness started falling and everything. And then we started having signs and wonders just explode. You know, uh, right away, 
we understood that there was going to be a battle. You know, I want to ask you, did you ever think there wasn't going to be a battle? I mean, come on. You know, when you're walking in the darkness and you're the light, there's going to be a battle. And God loves the battle. And whenever, everywhere we would go, it was like God would challenge the witch doctor. And because of that, he established from day one who had the higher authority. There was uh, one time that we went into a village. It was, uh, we have four churches that are 10 hours in a canoe. And uh, this is my most favorite testimony, except for people being born again. Those are my favorite. But uh, he was uh, a witch doctor, and we got in the village, and I was doing, the trick was horrible. And we got in there, and we had this uh, medical clinic with us. We were doing a medical thing, so people all over the jungle had come. And the witch doctor, I was preparing uh, stuff and getting all the kids uh, settled down. We had 50 teenagers with us at the time plus the medical group, and uh, the Lord, I saw this witch doctor in the moonlight, it was a full moon that night, and I saw him make some medicines against our group, and the Lord said, you go over to where the girls are sleeping, and that witch doctor has just sent a snake over there and one of the kids' sleeping bags, go get it and kill it, and so we went over there, and of course, I took an Indian with me, and I said, you killed a snake. <laughs> and so he killed the snake. And uh, that next day, the medical clinic began. And, uh, well, I was having a, a children's thing, and uh, there was these books that a church had given us, and it, they were on the miracles of Jesus. Well, nobody read at that time, but the pictures were beautiful. And so I was giving all the kids these books, and I had just enough. There's 400 kids in that village, and I had 400. And the witch doctor come up and asked me if he could have one of the books. Well, I didn't want to give it to him. I thought, you creep. You did that last night, and you're asking me for one of these books? No. You know? And God spoke to me almost in an audible voice, and he said, Jimmy, give him one of those books. So I gave him one. And the next day, the clinic began, and... Uh, the doc, he was the first one in line. I mean, that is the worst disgrace ever for a witch doctor to be in line to, to see a medical doctor. That is saying, I am a total failure. I have no power compared to the medical science. And so they get, he gets in there and the doctor uh, asked him if he was born again. It was totally outside the, the plan. And the guy said, no, the witch doctor, he said, no, but I've got to get born again today. And he said, why? And he said, because I read that book that girl gave me last night. And he said, Jesus appeared to me in the nighttime. And he told me if I did not get born again today that I would die and go to hell and burn in hell for eternity. And he said, I've lived my whole life in hell. I don't want to live in hell for eternity. And so he gets born again, and that night we had uh, an open-air crusade, and the witch doctor asked Dennis if he could give his testimony. Well, Dennis never lets them, because all they want to brag about is how much, how many people they killed. And so, can I have my water, then? And uh, so... Uh, then he's, he really felt led to let him do it. And it was like when he gave this testimony, it plunged me to a different level supernaturally. He said, when, I, when you all got in the canoes eight and a half hours away, he said, I saw you in the supernatural realm. Yeah. And he said, uh, you see... When children of the Most High God come into a dark area, he said, on their heads, the name of Jesus is written in blood. And there's a light that penetrates all the darkness where they're at. And a horn blows and it says, attention, there's a child of the Most High God walking in the area. 
And he said, the deeper the child walks, another, the light gets brighter, and it illuminates all of the darkness around it. And the horn blows again, and it says, attention, there's a child of the Most High God walking in the area. And he says, the deeper the child goes into the darkness, the brighter the light gets, and it illuminates all of the darkness. And it says, attention, and he says, it bellers all throughout the supernatural realm. And he says, there's a child of the Most High God walking in the area. And he said, we all began to tremble. And he says, we hope that they do not know that they bear the most powerful name in all of the universe. And we hope that they do not know that the word of God coming out of their mouth, every sickness, every disease, every circumstance, everything in life yeah. has to come to a screeching halt and balance me yes. because they are children of the Most High God. That testimony changed my life. It just plunged me to victory in so many areas. And I realized the importance of being obedient one step at a time with God. Do it no matter how stupid the thing seems to you. Do what God tells you to do because there is, you are the light in that situation. No matter how bad the situation is, you are the light in that situation. And make up your mind, it's not all about you. It is not about you. It is about them. God's children are dying and going to hell. And he needs someone to be there in order to present the gospel to them. And so, as the time went on, uh, all the churches are established down there, solid in the Word of God. Miracles and signs and wonders started happening everywhere. Uh, one of my most favorite ones, I'll tell that one, then I'll tell some current ones. Uh, one night we had a crusade, and uh, in the jungle, you're the only thing going on, and so it's always successful. You can't, you can't fail. And so, whenever you have anything going on, the cattle trucks come, everybody comes, it's like the county fair. And there's tons of people that come, and they've come to hear the Word of God and to worship God. And we were there, and we had this, um, this pastor from Mexico come in. And uh, this pastor, he was kind of a real different kind of guy. And... Uh, the church was, there were so many people there that night, we had to take the back of the church off so people could see. And so we took the back of the church off, and the pastor, we couldn't get through, and so everybody just stayed outside, and they started worshiping the Lord. One thing that we have never done is we've never Americanized the Indians. Wow. We let Indians be Indians. Wow. We let them do what they do, you know. And so... They're worshiping on their bombs, getting down, and they're just really worshiping God. And about, I don't know, 100, 110 kids all get up and start dancing in the spirit. It has never happened before and never has since then. They're dancing and dancing. That building that was so full of people, nobody could move, and these children never touched anybody. And they danced and danced, and then they fell out in the Holy Ghost. And then a young teenage girl, I think she's about 14, she gets up. And I'm telling you, I have never seen anything so beautiful in my whole life as that child. She danced like she was a trained ballerina. She danced and danced and danced. There was nothing going on. Everybody was so captivated about how beautiful her dancing was. And then she falls out in the Holy Ghost. And then this this pastor, this being the teacher, he comes up and, you know, everybody's sitting on tree stumps and everything, and he comes up and this little boy on the front line, he grabs his hand and he says, run with me. And everybody went, ah, doesn't he know that child's never walked in his life? Doesn't he know that that child's had five operations and they told him there's no possibility whatsoever that he could walk? And he grabbed that little boy's hand and from day one he ran out 
and he ran all around that church. Well, then everything exploded. <clears throat> you know, crippled boy, born crippled, got healed. And then the young girl gets up that was dancing, and she asked if she could give her testimony. And she said, and I know, I've known this girl ever since she was born. And uh, she said, you all know that I have epilepsy. And uh, I've never been able to go to school. I've never been able to play outside with all the other children because I have so many seizures and everybody's afraid to be around me. And she said, tonight, Jesus came and he said, may I have this dance? And he danced with her. And from that day forward, that child has never had another seizure. Instantly healed, totally. She's married with two children today. And so, uh, another testimony just recently. We have conferences every three months for all the leaders and the pastors in the Darien. And uh, we had this one conference, and this girl come in. She was not a pastor's wife. She come uh, to see if she could give her testimony. And so I let her. And so she came in, and uh, everybody knew this girl as the Chicha girl. I don't know if anybody speaks Spanish here, but Chicha is a, like a fresh fruit drink. They make it, you know, like pineapple. They'll crush all the pineapples up and put water, and then they put sugar in it. It's called Chicha. And so she sells Chicha everywhere in the jungle. And uh, she said, uh, you know, three months ago, <clears throat> uh, I was preparing. Uh, she lives about, I think, three hours deep in the jungle. And she said, uh, my family was all out in the field. Everybody is farmers in the jungle. And uh, they were all out in the field, and they were all farming and everything, and she was home cooking, and this is kind of normal in the jungle, you know, the whole family will go out and work in the field, kind of like we used to here, and then at night they come back, well, she was making what we call ojadra, ojadra is kind of like you would call fried bit bread or elephant ears, you know, it's just kind of like biscuits that you pound out and you throw it in the, in the grease, and she had like uh, five pounds, or uh, five gallons of oil in a huge pot. And she was getting it real hot, and it got so that it was bubbling, which meant that she could put her, her, uh, her bread down in there. And it was not sitting on the fire. We all uh, cook outside. And it wasn't sitting on the kindling wood, right? And so she went to rearrange it a little bit so the heat would get all the same all around the pot. And she tripped and five gallons of oil, boiling hot oil, went all over her body. And she screamed out. She said, Jesus. And he said, run over to the low tree. Cut you some of those leaves and put them all over your body. And every time that you feel pain, you put that, is it a low? Yeah. Hello, uh, oil all over your body. Well, her family come home that night, and they said, oh, Mama, what happened? And she told them what happened. They said, let's leave now. We'll go into Panama. And they said, she said, no, I'm not going anywhere. Me and Jesus, we got this one covered. And she said that she looked like a toasted marshmallow. That is how bad she was burned. Face, everything, legs, arms, everything. And little by little, her, she began to heal. She came to give her testimony. And that woman had the most beautiful skin you'd ever want to see. Not one skin graft, not one aspirin for pain. Totally standing on the word of God, believing God for healing. You know, so many times... Uh, we get discouraged when we think uh, God don't move. You know, we'll be praying and, and we be, we're believing God for something and we get discouraged because we don't see results. But we have no idea what's going on in the supernatural realm. 
Don't put God in a box. And as you're praying, you believe God and you stay faithful, speaking the word of God in that situation until you see results. And you don't give one budge. You pray it until you see it happen. Well, we were all, because we live in the drug world, we have a real problem with drugs. And we were losing some of our teenagers to the drug world. This last year, we had two teenagers uh, die in the jungle, 15 years old. One of them killed herself. It was just, it's been a really rough year. And so, anyway, we, all the churches are praying for their teenagers. And, uh, but never in my wildest mind would I, I ever thought God would work this way. One night, in one of the villages, this girl, she is, I think she's 14, around there. And she is known as the drug queen. And uh, the reason for that is... She could drink any man underneath the table. I mean, she was good. And she was the first one to take any new drug out. Well, she was also the daughter of one of the witch doctors. There's four witch doctors in that village. And so she, uh, when she got there, uh, she started screaming hysterical, out of control, and went on for hours and hours. And finally, the witch doctor come over to the pastor's hut, and he said, Pastor, he said, I've done everything I know what to do. Nothing's working. I can't get that kid to shut up. He said, could you come over and do whatever you do? You know, <laughs> see if you can make something work on this kid. And so the pastor said, yeah. And so he goes over there, and the Spirit of God hit the doctor, or hit the pastor, and right from the beginning, he said, shut up, and instantly, shut up. Not one word afterwards, she lay there like she was dead. Why? The light was stronger than the dark. And he said, I want to know what's going on with you. And so the young girl said, well, she said, I took this new drug, and this new drug made me go out of my mind. And... When I was just really, really high, Jesus appeared to me. And he come down and he took me by the arm and he said, Come here, young lady. And he took her down to the gates of hell. And he opened up the gates of hell. And he says, there's two roads in life. There's one that leads to eternity, living in peace with me. And there's one that goes here. And you, my dear, are on your way there. And she looked into hell there was her entire family that had died before her. Her grandma was in there, and she said, Honey, get your life right before God. Don't come here. You don't want to come here. No matter what you think is so fun, it's not worth the price that you're going to have to pay here. The fire is so hot, our flesh is, bro is burning off of us. There's no food here. We have to eat each other. And she said... And not to mention the torment. The torment never quits. Day and night we're tormented in our mind. Well, the young girl got stuck in hell. And that's what all the screaming was about. Mm -hmm. And so when uh, the pastor said, but you fail to realize there's another road. You don't have to take that road. Jesus said there was two roads. You don't have to go down that road. And so he led her to the Lord. Well, Miss Drug Queen become on fire for God. Yeah. We're having revival like you would not believe. God appeared to another girl in that village, and guess what he told her all about? Heaven. What it's like to be in heaven. How nice, how beautiful, how wonderful. Those two kids are winning their people to the Lord. They're... they're generation to the Lord. Why? God will always manifest himself. He will always call the light to shine out of the darkness. And once the devil thinks he's got something up his sleeve, you better believe God's going to come. And he's going to outshine that devil. He's going to take authority over that situation. 
and he's going to establish who has the final word in there. He's the one that wears the victor's crown. We had another situation with drugs. And one of the head guys, I don't know if you guys know a lot about drugs, but there's uh, the drug cartel in uh, Colombia. They all have a way that they kill people, and that's their mark. And so uh, they, uh, if you snitch on uh, somebody in the drug world, they cut your tongue out. Everybody knows it's the drug world. And so this one uh, kid, he was known as one of them that would cut your tongue out. And so he was a really kind of bad, bad name kid. And uh, he was walking down the street one night. Of course, everybody was afraid of him. And he, uh, this cross appeared to him. He said it was as big as the sky. Just rose up, the big as the sky. And God said to him, there's two roads in life, son. There's the road you're going down, and then there's a road to heaven. The road to heaven is the road to a second chance. He said, you've made a mess out of your life. If you want a second chance, I'm the God that can give you a second chance. He took the second chance. Hallelujah. And because he took the second chance, and of course, the testimony of being born again. I mean, to me, signs and wonders, people being raised from the dead, all of that stuff, it's wonderful, but there's absolutely nothing like the miracle that takes place when a person is born again. And so, he gets born again, on fire for God in another one of the churches. And of course, it's a testimony to all the teenagers around him. And uh, his brother, he gets a message one day that his brother in, in Panama City was in a coma. They had found him passed out in an alley they took him into Panama, uh, into the uh, social medicine hospital there, and they told the family that he's in a coma, he will never come out. If he does, he won't know anyone. There's no chance that he could live because he had been drinking since he was nine years old, doing drugs since he was nine years old, and it hard drugs. It wasn't marijuana, it was hard drugs. And so he, uh, he was laying there, and uh, he had destroyed every one of his organs. Every one of his organs. There was no way that the kid was going to live. And so uh, Charliano, the boy they got that was the tongue guy, he, uh, he came and went into Panama City to see his brother. And so the doctor met him there and told him all about it. And as Charliana was sitting by his brother's side, uh, he said that he asked God, he said, God, you gave me a second chance. Would you give my brother a second chance? And he said, when he said that, his brother opened his eyes up. And he said, Charliana, I am starving. Is there any food around here? <laughs> and so the doctor comes running in there and he says, well, I don't want you to get your hopes up. Even though he came out of it, and he knows, you know, people. Uh, the kid has destroyed every organ in his body. There's no way that he can be healed. Or no way that he can walk out of here. And so, uh, in two weeks, they released that kid. He's 22 years old. Been a drug addict and an alcoholic since nine years old. They released him in two weeks with brand new liver, brand new heart, brand new lungs. Everything was made whole and solid. Why? There's a God that gave a second chance. Wow. There's uh, one more testimony I want to tell you. Um, we had a little baby that died in one of the villages. And this little baby, um, she, the little baby was 24 hours old. And she started having breathing problems, and they carried her to a clinic, and the clinic checked the baby out, and they said, there's no way that this baby can live because one of the lungs did not develop, and the other one is full of disease. 
And he told the mom, he says, you bet, you might as well just go home and dig a hole because this baby's not going to live. And so she screamed, no. And she ran out the door and she ran to her pastor's house, which was eight miles away. This woman had walked 15 miles with a sick baby. Plus, now she's running eight miles to her pastor's house. And 24 hours earlier, she had a baby. Wow. And so she gets there, and she said, Pastor, come quick. They say the baby's dead. The baby's going to die. So the pastor, they both ran back to the clinic. When they got to the door, uh, the doctor met him at the door, and it's against the law to touch a dead body in the jungle because they don't embalm them. And so there's a lot of disease, you know. And so uh, he said, I'm sorry, but your baby died while you were gone. I'm so sorry. And the pastor said it was like something punched him in the stomach. And he couldn't contain it. And he said rivers started going round and round inside. And it just kept getting higher and higher and stronger. And he said he ran over and he picked up that baby. The baby was in the corner. The baby had been dead five hours. And he said the baby is all wrapped in linen. And he picked up that baby and he started groaning in the Holy Ghost. And he said all of a sudden he felt the river erupt. And it come up out of his mouth and went into the mouth of the child. And the child was raised from the dead. The child had been dead five hours when this happened. So the doctors had to go into Panama City to present why they had signed a death certificate falsely. Because the baby was not dead. And they said that he, they signed the same. And so the pastor went with them. They check out the baby, they, and the doctors come before the medical board, and they said, we want to know why you would falsify a false certificate for a child as healthy as this. We have run every test on this child. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this child. And so in Panama, there's nothing like a, a personal witness to anything. And so the pastor said, this baby was dead. I want to speak on behalf of these, these doctors. He said, that baby was dead. I was there when the baby was born. The baby is having problems breathing. I was there in the clinic when the baby was pronounced dead. There was no life in that baby. They had already signed the death certificate. He was wrapped in linen. And he said, but this rumbling started. And it kept going round and round and round inside of me. And he said, I ran over and I picked up that baby. And he said, I felt the life of God come up out of me and into the mouth of that child. And that baby lives. And the doctors were so flabbergasted by it. They, on the medical board it said, baby was dead. Baby's not dead now. Unknown sources. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you all. You know, Dennis and I obeyed the call of God on our life, but we have never been able, would never have been able, to do anything without financial and prayer support. You know, we may have been the ones that went, but you guys make all this possible. You make that radio stay on the station every day. You give us the ability to travel. You know, one of those churches is $300 one way to go there. You guys are a part of that. And we just want to thank you from the bottom of our heart for being so faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.